In 1991, Kuki Goldman wrote, I Dreamed of Africa, a book about love and loss that captured the imagination of people around the world. Today, Kuki is still in Africa, working to preserve the land, educating children and adults about conservation, and creating programs with her daughter that she hopes will influence generations to come. It is so nice to see you here in America. It's wonderful to be here again. Again. When you wrote I Dreamed of Africa, what made you pick that title? Because I did dream of Africa when I was a child in Italy. I wanted to go somewhere wild, somewhere with big horizons, where different people live, who spoke different languages. It had to be Africa. And when you got there, did it live up to your expectations or was it so totally foreign that you thought, I, I don't know if I can do this? It wasn't foreign at all. I think there was something really special about particularly Kenya, East Africa. And there is a feeling there of deja vu. It feels as if you've been there before. It felt to me that I already knew those hills and those savannas and those gorges and those animals. It looked and it felt like a place where I came from. And in fact, it's true. Many people, uh, if they lived in a place that took the life of their husband and of their son, would have said, I've had enough. I can't stay here. Why did you stay? Well, you know, it wasn't Africa's fault. People die everywhere in the world. They die in accident, they die of disease, they commit suicide. I'm not the only person in the world who's lost a son or a husband. The fact that they died so close to one another into separate tragic accident was the sensational thing, in a way. But it was up to me to make a difference and to stay on. And a tragedy becomes only impossible to deal with if the individual to whom this uh, tragedy has occurred doesn't do anything about it. I decided that Emanuele's death, particularly, because he was only 17 when he was killed, should teach me a lesson. And the lesson was that whatever happens to you, whatever obstacle, challenges life brings to you, you have to stay on and face these challenges and try to do something about that. And you did. So tell me what you did about it. Well, you see, I looked around and I chose Africa for love because I dreamed of Africa as a child. And I went there with a man I loved and Africa took it away from me. He, he, he died and he, I was pregnant when he died. I was expecting our child, Sveva. And that fact alone gave me a huge amount of strength because there is something important about giving birth to somebody, to a child, that of a man who's no longer there for a woman, you know. It's like the man isn't really dead. The part of him is still part of you. And you're going to give birth to this man. You've been his friend, his companion, his, la his wife, and, and now you're going to be his mother to an extent. So that was important to me. But also I felt that, uh, you know, Africa has taken a lot from me, but Africa needed help. And I wanted to learn to project another aspect of Africa, an aspect that was lyrical and he healing and healthy, as opposed to the sad Africa, the Africa of disease, the Africa of corruption, the Africa of violence, which exists. There are many faces to any continent. Certainly, Africa has all the, the, the drama and all the tragedy, but also an incredible beauty, an incredible compassion and the kindness of its people. You have a project uh, that you do in honor of Emmanuel. Tell me about that. It's this a is great called the project. Galman uh, Africa Conservancy. In memory of Emmanuel, the first thing I actually did, I decided to open the place to young people. Because for a mother to lose a son is an incredible waste and an agony. It's the silence of his voice, it's the silence of his step on the corridor. This was very difficult for me to come to terms with. But when I decided to open the place to other underprivileged children from Africa, the ones who never seen wildlife, because you know, 
it's an extraordinary thing that it may sound to you. Very few Africans have ever seen an elephant. Or a lion. Or a lion, or a gazelle for that matter. And yet it is them that one day will make policy, some of them at least, that can or not protect something they've never seen. And of course they cannot value. Every tourist is an elephant who comes to Kenya, but very few Africa can afford that. So I decided to do that and I opened the place to the children and I built a wilderness center where we host for free the local children. By now over 48,000 kids have seen their first wildlife for free on Nero since my son died. So that is in itself something that I think is valuable and it really helped me to heal my wounds. But then I started the, uh, what in the United States is called Africa, Galman Africa Conservancy and uh, Galman Memorial Foundation otherwise in, in Kenya and in the rest of the world. And the idea is to prove that the presence and the activity of people in Africa can be reconciled with the protection of the environment and the natural resources. Well, let's talk about that because you are 100,000 acres and around you are a lot of small farms and the animals are being driven out. Tell me about that. Well, people in Africa now, sadly, they regard the animal as the enemy in conflict with their activity, which is understandable because if you plant maize, corn, as you say here, in, in Africa, you know, and the animals keep going through this maize and the first time they go, maybe they were going from one place to another and they find the maize, but then they got a taste for it, so they eat it. And by eating it, they destroy the livelihood of the entire family for the entire year. So you can't really blame them if they see these elephants as the enemy. Likewise, if you have a herd of cattle and the lions eat the cattle, that's the same thing. So it is a constant fight between the wild and the tame in Africa. The entire point is, though, that you must teach the people and help the people to see the beauty and the resources that come with the protection of the environment and the natural resources. Well, you're working with a lot of the uh, native groups that live around you, the tribes, and teaching them how to conserve their resources. With all these different tribes in Africa and you sitting sort of in the middle of them on the Great Rift, do you ever find that when they disagree, you're caught in the middle of it? Well, there is huge conflict uh, for the same resources, particularly between pastures, because they move, they need pasture, they need water, they need grazing, etc. So Samburu and Pokot are fighting forever. At this moment in time, there is a major battle going on. And yes, we are caught in the middle, but we don't take sides. I made very clear from the beginning that we understand that they have problems and we are trying to help them as we can without siding from one or another. It would be fatal if we did. So what I'm trying to do for them, which will intrigue you, is that I went down into the Pocot just the other day, the day before I left uh, for coming to America, actually, and I, I met the elders and I told them, look, why don't you find a place where, in your opinion, it is good for tourists to come and visit? A place that must have water, it must have lovely view and beautiful trees and shade. And then I'll try to help you to make a little stop over for a start where tourists can come, have a picnic, have a meal, see your dancing, buy your honey, buy your craft, etc., etc. And then the money all goes to you. Start a little group, self-help, and see how we can start from there. And it was very well received. That's a true... Uh I think that's very much a woman's solution. It is proactive. You see, men are reactive. I punch your nose, you punch my nose, etc. <laughs> you know, we women try to actually find ways in which, <laughs> in which we sort things out in a different way. We drink a cup of coffee, we drink a cup of tea, and we chat about it, and things are sold. go back to when Paolo passed away and there you were with Emmanuel and a baby in your stomach and then young Sveva and here you were two two women and a, and a young boy making your way in Africa how did you do that where did you find the strength I think my daughter was the reason for many things for me and she was, she was like uh, my good luck because when Paolo died I was pregnant I was four months pregnant so I had to hold on for the baby and when Emanuele died, three years later, she was only three years old, and I couldn't sort of let her down, so I had to hold on for her. 
And now she's grown, she's 26 years old, she's tremendous. She's come back to Africa with all her knowledge and her immense compassion and beauty and intelligence. And she's really, for me, my greatest success because I could not give her a family, but I could give her a vision. Can you tell me about the work she's doing now? Her project is called Four Generations, and four generations means children, parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. Now, the children are going to school, the parents went to school. The grandparents and great-grandparents didn't, but they have a different knowledge that was brought from mother to, to daughter, from father to son, which is not written down. So she is intriguing the children in going and search for their own traditions, and the question that she puts them, they have to find the answer for. And in order to find the answer, they have to go and find the elders. Not necessarily their own grandfather and grandmother, if they're no longer alive, but somebody else's of that tribe. Say, creation stories. Where did the Pokot come from? Where did the Samburu come from? What is the Kikuyu background? And so on. So the children, is very intriguing for them because they have to go and look for it. It's like a treasure hunt. They have to write it all down, they have to record it from the voice of the great-grandparents in vernacular, and then they have to translate it into stories that they then have to act for the other children. So all the entire school and the other tribes can see what the Kikuyu are doing, or what the Kikuyu traditions were, or the Pokot traditions were, and it is a way of building bridges, which is very, very important. And also creating an oral history for people who never wrote anything down. Absolutely. You know, I think it is very important to remember that in the world today, we are losing environment, we are losing um, the, the very air we breathe. It's, uh, the global warming is no longer something which is uh, uh, in, impossible to believe because everybody is sampling that in everyday's life. Ecology is no longer the word that is at the back of the newspaper in the magazine together with the horoscope. It is headline news and it happens everywhere in the world. And in Africa, the loss of uh, environment is, is tragic because it's happening very, very rapidly. So it is very important to try and find ways and means in which this can stop. And it is people who've lost the reason for preserving things who are destroying their environment. The natural resources of Africa used to give people a livelihood. These days, people go, for instance, to the shop to buy the medicine. In the past, they were going through the bush to find the roots and the fruit and the berries and the leaves and the barks to, uh, to cook up the medicines. And so, you see, and now they don't. So they look at the plants as weeds. They don't regard the plants as a resource anymore. Anymore, and they get rid of them. So Sveva's project, besides being an oral history and saving generations of knowledge, is also saving generations of knowledge about the actual environment it, in which the people used absolutely. to live. It is very practical, this project, you see. Because, for instance, traditional medicine can become, in the, in the world today, something that is very appealing to people to buy. Look at the Amazons in South America and all the intention of, of helping that land there that has gone, and the money and the, and the support over the years to protect the forest, not just because of the forest, which of course is important per se, but also because the people of the forest remember the uses of the medicinal plant in the forest, which can be used by people everywhere in the world. When I came to see you in Africa, um, I came to meet you and a little snake, a very dangerous little snake, crossed my path and I started, and you said, oh, Emmanuel has come to meet you. It is his spirit. And you know, I think when you die, you become everything. Your energy is everywhere. And Emmanuel certainly is also the snake, and he's the bird, and he's the air, and he's everything around me. You planted two flame trees next to each other on your property, one for Paolo, one for Emmanuel. They're very beautiful. Why did you pick those trees, and why did you decide to have it right there outside your window? Yellow fever tree. Yellow fever tree. Uh, because Paolo loved the acacia, the yellow fever tree. It was his favorite tree. And about a month or so before his accident, he had all this premonition that something would happen to him. He had many narrow escapes, car crashes and accidents like that. And he said, when I die, remember, I wanted to plant a tree on my grave, and it has to be a yellow fever tree. So I followed what he wanted. A week before Emanuele was killed in his accident, he also had a premonition. We went fishing for black bass in one of our lakes, and he told me, Pep, I would like to tell you what I would like you to do if I die. 
and he told me that he wanted the tree on his grave, that he wanted the pillow below his head that I had embroidered. Now, I hate embroidery, I don't have time for embroidering, but now and again I do these things, especially, to prove that I can do also the <laughs> embroidery. And so I'd embroidered a little cushion for him. And he, he wanted that below his head, and he wanted the grave next to Paolo, and he wanted the yellow fever on his grave. And you know there is something special about planting a tree on a grave of someone, because the roots get fed by the body. So really, the tree becomes them. The shape of the tree is different, but it is still a shape that you can touch. The body is transformed. And I like transformation. I like this change from one substance to another substance, from one being to another being. Paolo and Emanuele's essence is everywhere, the spirit is everywhere, and the body has become a tree. And the tree gives me shade, and the bees are going to the tree and they make the honey, and the birds nest on the tree. And you know what I do? I take the seeds from those trees, and I plant them in a tree nursery, and we give the trees to the school children who come and visit in the um, education center in memory of Emanuele. So now there are hundreds and hundreds of Paolos and Emanuele, th thousands in fact, growing all over Kenya. And, um, so Paolo and Emanuele are alive as trees, their bodies is, their substance is, in many different shapes. I call them my grandchildren. You and Sveva really were two against the world in Kenya as, as she was growing up. What was it like being two women alone in Africa? Do you think it's different than being two women alone anywhere? Maybe two women alone uh, as a family, as a mother and a daughter, have to face challenges and things wherever they happen to be. In Africa, of course, the challenges are different, of a different kind. But Zveva and I are a team, and that is a wonderful relationship we have. So yes, we have a very different way of dealing with events than a man would have, certainly. Because we are proactive. We try to, to, to come across and, and to meet challenges in a, in a way which is creative, which is sustainable, which is compassionate. We don't, we're not afraid of losing the battle. You know, you can lose a battle sometimes and you can win a war in the end. It's not really important. Important is to try and be a person of integrity, a person who takes challenges with grace and with courage and gets on whatever happens to you. And I think it was important because to Zveva I could not give her much in the way of family, but I really could give her something she believes in, something which is worthwhile. I believe we are all born to give back. We cannot sit back and think the world is going to do it for us. We have to get on and do it ourselves. And I've learned this lesson. It has taken some time. It has taken many tears. The most important thing is that this lesson in this world today is valid wherever we happen to be. Because the environment that we are protecting, the culture of the people that we are protecting there, are under threat. And so everybody has to do their piece. What do you advise people? for them to do in order to make a difference? I think everybody has a potential. I think it's very important that people try to find out what their potential is. Whatever you do, you can do that in a, such a way that you're making a difference, whatever is your choice of a profession. For instance, an example, many people have written to me and contacted me after I wrote my first book, because it was a book of revelation of the suffering of a mother uh, losing a child. But men, many mothers throughout the world with children, and many have written to me, and fathers. For instance, a man wrote to me not so long ago from America, and he said to me in his email this time, when you wrote your book, I Dreamed of Africa, I wrote to you, and I wrote to you that I could not understand how could a parent get over the death of a child, because I could not conceive my life without my son. But last week, my son was killed in a car crash. My life has come to an end. I cannot survive. I can't find any reason for living. What do I do? Can you help me? How did you do it? So I, I wrote back to him immediately. Email is actually magical in that respect because you can immediately uh, reply. And I said, look, I don't know anything about you. I don't know what you're doing for a living. I don't know what your means are. I can only tell you what I've done. I put all my energy, all my means, all my time, all my desperation and all my desire of doing something good and positive, into creating something good and positive 
because my son is no longer there. Do the same. If you have no money, you can still sit with a dying person and tell her a story or him a story. You can still give a sweet to a child. Do something that you wouldn't have done if your son was no longer um, you know, uh, with you. And uh, he did it. But grief is something that's so personal and so many people really do retreat into a shell. How do you, how do you advise them to get over that? I think, again, uh, of course, people uh, have to deal with their grief as they choose. You cannot really teach people how to do that. It's impossible. But you can by example and by showing that actually if you put, if you consider that so many other people in the world are losing their children. If you just look in, open a paper and you see at, at, the, at the announcement of people who die and remember that everybody is a mother, a father, a friend, a lover, a child crying for these people. You are not unique and you can therefore see yourself in a stream of other people who are losing the people they care for. And that is important as an exercise to do, because then you don't feel singled out by fate and you don't feel sorry for yourself. That is the worst thing to do, feeling sorry for yourself. No, you get over that and you feel that you're still alive and you're the man or the, the child or the, 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 the daughter that has died is there somewhat to inspire you. And in, for this child, you have the duty not to make sure, to make sure that his life or her life was not wasted. And that is the most crucial thing of all. And that can only happen if you do something different, something that you would not have died if the child was still with you. What are your hopes for the future, for yourself, for Africa? for Sveva? Well, I hope that Olareniru, I like Ipia Nature Conservancy, through the Galman Africa Conservancy, will become the beacon of hope for Africa and for East Africa that I was hoping in the beginning it would become. It has already, really, because hundreds of people, thousands of people have visited and have seen and they found inspiration in the way that we protected the biodiversity of this magical place with incredible nature, with the forest, with gorges, with valleys, with animals of all sorts and with different culture living in harmony there. So I hope that that will survive in the future. I know it will. I believe that in the world today, the monuments, the real monuments, are no longer Venice and Florence. Of course they are monuments, we know that. But they are man-made and they can be somewhat reproduced. But the elephants are, the valleys, the savannas, the great forests, once they go, they go forever. And I believe it is our collective responsibility as human beings to care for what is not ours to destroy, which is the natural world. I believe very passionately in that. Do you have many more stories to write about Africa, about your life, about the world? I got thousands of stories to write. I've got no time, but I've got thousands of stories to write. And I think the next story is a story of growth. You go to Africa as a person with dreams and with imagination, in love, and for adventure, and for animals and beauty, for a conventional Africa of technicolor. Then you meet the real Africa, and it hurts you. Then you survive this Africa, and with this Africa you find this healing, and this vision, and this growth. And I think this is the story now. Do you ever wonder about the choices women have made throughout history? I have some stories for you. The remarkable life of Annie Oakley was depicted in the Broadway musical, Annie Get Your Gun. What most people don't know is that the shooting skills that made her so famous were developed as a means of supporting her family after Annie's father died. 
For 17 years, Annie Oakley and her shooting feats were the main attraction in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. They say that necessity is the mother of invention. What can you do with what you already know? You may be surprised. We have all kinds of interesting information to share with you on our website, balancingyourlifeonline.com. I'm Ellen Sussman. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time. your life is made possible in part by the Lee and Joseph D. Jamail Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase, Sarah S. Morgan, Fred Barron and Lisa Blue. Additional funding is provided by the Lori M. Tisch Foundation, Andrea and Jim Gordon, Goldman Sachs, Amagi Bank, I.W. Marks Jewelers, Terrell W. and Joan B. Oxford, and others. For a complete list, visit us at www.balancingyourlifeonline.com.